Got it. Okay. Perfect. So everyone can see it. All right. Well, thanks. And uh, I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Chip, for the nice introduction. And I think that uh, will describe the multiple hats I'm often wearing. And in particular, uh, the hat I'll be mostly wearing today is the chair of the Western Atlantic Bluefin Tuna Committee for the ICAT Standing Committee on Research and Statistics. And so I'll be presenting on the management strategy and primarily management procedure approach that we've been building and hope to have the commission adopt this year. And as well, Chip noted that I'm the co-chair of the uh, National MSE Technical Working Group for NIMS. I have no longer the co-chair, but I'll also be presenting some work from that here. I've fortunately been able to pass on the, that co-chairing co to other people. And I'm also affiliated with the Southeast Fisheries Science Center. And so I'll be talking a little bit about applications that might be useful for the South Atlantic here. So my overview, I'll talk about the National MSE Vision Statement that I think is useful from the standpoint of the technical committee and where we see MSEs being useful for future. I'll go into what management procedures are and MSE in general, then in detail on the Booth and Tuna MSE that's ongoing. I'll present some of the information we put together on when to do MSE that I think is particularly useful for allocating the scarce resources that we all have, and then some potential applications to the South Atlantic. So the vision statement. And this is, comes from work done by the National uh, Technical Working Group on MSEs. We anticipate that MSEs will result in an improved understanding of our ability to assess stocks, ecosystems, and fishing in coastal communities, and the trade-offs inherent in management decisions. This will lead to more informed management, more efficient allocation of survey and assessment resources, greater potential for stakeholder ownership of the process, and ultimately increased economic benefits and improved capacity for sustainable management for current and future generations. So it's a pretty expansive vision statement for what MSEs can provide. I hope in my presentation today, I'll show a little bit of what the opportunities that are available. And my take home message, if you take nothing else from this presentation, understand what management procedures are. These may represent a paradigm shift for fisheries management away from the way we do business. Right now, we do business with the best assessment plus prediction approach. That isn't always useful. It isn't always applicable in every situation. And in particular, we're facing something that we haven't in the past faced, which is a rapid environmental change that really challenges the key assumption of our stock assessments that the environment is stationary. That is the underpinning assumption about all of our benchmarks, and it's the thing that's most likely to be challenged by changing climate, changing environment, and changing ecosystem. Once we've lost the ability to make that assumption, then it challenges our ability to have clear benchmarks, and it makes our normal process of a best assessment and then predicting forward challenging in an advice, con uh, in an advice framework. Management procedures, as I'll illustrate, offer an opportunity and a path forward. And you'll see why and how as I go on. And then the other take home is that MSE is a means to an end. It's not the end itself. It's powerful, but it's not cheap. And I would recommend only embarking upon it when one has a clear idea of the objective and has exhausted other means to get an adequate answer cheaper and faster. And that's going to be a key take home that about how difficult and time consuming the process can be, how often we can get enough of an answer a lot simpler, faster and cheaper. So what is management strategy evaluation? And I'm starting off with what I think is the most important aspect is not the process, but the goal. The goal is a management procedure. And that's a pre-agreed framework for setting catch limits designed to achieve specific management objectives. It can be empirical, i.e. index-based, or it can be model-based. But the goal here is something that allows us to manage fisheries to provide the annual catch limits and that's responsive to feedback such as changes in the indices or changes in the environment. The management strategy evaluation is a simulation-based analytical framework used to evaluate the performance of multiple managed procedures relative to pre-specified objectives, and then ultimately to select one managed procedure to put in place. It may involve substantial dialogue between scientists, managers, and stakeholders, 
or it can be as simple as a desk MSE or an analyst is running it on a computer. One of the key aspects of them is that you've got to have defined management objectives. These are formally adopted goals for the fishery. They can either be predetermined, as in what Magnus and Stevens already determined for us in an optimal yield, or it can be developed during the MSE process. But unless you have these management objectives, you can't evaluate the performance of managed procedures, and so you won't be able to select them based on performance. So I'll go into the context for the ICAT Bluefin Management Strategy Evaluation setting and why it's one of, been one of the most challenging MSEs to embark upon. Bluefin, if you're aware of it, has two or more stocks in the Atlantic, and the figure on the right in blue are tracks of fish of believe known eastern origin, they spawn in the Mediterranean. Then in red are tracks of fish of presumed known western origins by, identified by spawning in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see a substantial mixing. This was data from several years ago. We've now seen even more substantial mixing that's also been verified by overlook microchemistry and genetics, which indicates that the fisheries in the western Atlantic are up to 60 percent eastern origin fish in the current time period. There's also time varying and environmentally driven productivity. We've seen this in a historical, uh, one of the major concerns and major sources of uncertainty in assessment is that we've had two different hypotheses on the stock recruitment relationships, one a beverage and Holt and one a two line hypothesis, which is an assumption that there's been a regime shift over time. These two stock recruitment relationships have been, we've been unable to determine which one is more plausible and it's not been particularly helpful in providing disparate management advice to decision makers, where they essentially could choose the management advice on the basis of which is stock recruitment assumption, and science has not been able to, uh, to sort out the difference. In addition, we've seen substantial environmentally modulated uh, movement patterns and potentially um, migration towards areas of high and favorable productivity. Then we've got uncertainty in some of the basic biology, such as the age of maturity. And again, this species is highly migratory and moves throughout the Atlantic and is captured by numerous fisheries. The stock assessments in particular have been challenged by this. We've applied virtual population analysis to both the eastern and western stocks, stock synthesis to the western stock. And one of the key issues, probably the, the weakest point of the stock assessments is that we do them on an area basis. I, we split it at 45 degrees and say this is the western stock, when in fact it is a western area, or it is only a western area and it's comprised of at least two different stocks. And we do the same in the east, which means that we're, our fundamental assumption of a unit stock is violated. We also have not been able to develop in recent years biomass-based benchmarks. We've used an F uh, fish mortality policy. And then in re we've known that the Eastern Bluefin VPA has been unreliable for management. In this year alone, we determined that the Western VPA was not suitable for management advice in addition this year at this time. And then an external review noted that stock synthesis may not be reliable for management advice at all. So at the same time, the complexity of the stock is uh, quite high. Our ability to provide standard stock assessment advice is being diminished. And that's really the context for why management strategy evaluation is really, we see as the path forward for uh, providing management advice. Then in terms of the context of the East-West mixing, the Eastern population is, we believe, about 10 times higher than the Western one. And particularly if you base it on landings, then the landings are much higher and 94% come from the Eastern area, primarily in the Mediterranean from Perth Saints. This time series shows the time series of landings. You see this big flat line area at about 50,000 metric tons. This is a time period when the landings in the east were not well regulated, and we don't have a good handle on what the absolute magnitude of the removals are. And in fact, it's a strong assumption that they were capped at 50,000. They could be higher, they could be lower, which means that the primary thing that drives the productivity estimate of a stock assessment is the removals. And this is something for about a 15 year time period that we have very uh, weak information on what the total magnitude is. And that's an additional concern and, and uncertainty in the stock assessment. Nonetheless, this fishery in the Atlantic 
is of substantial value, of at least a billion dollars in annual value. And 50%, greater than 50% of the total bluefin in the entire world comes from the Atlantic. It really is the bluefin factory. So these combine to make an extremely valuable one, yet our ability to assessment is, is challenged. So uh, in addition, I, and I showed the movement or migration patterns from the tagging data. This is from recent genetic evidence that, that indicates that the fish that we see in the western side are, are of substantial Mediterranean origin. These are these orange fish in the pies. There's also a number of fish about 25% that are unassigned to either Gulf or Mediterranean that may be of another population. We see very uh, much less impact of a Gulf of Mexico Western stock in the Eastern areas, which indicates that a less degree of mixing into this area by Western fish. The other backdrop, I noted that the uh, tagging information, this comes from electronic tagging of Gulf of Mexico origin assumed fish, on the bottom, in the middle, Mediterranean origin fish, and then blue fish that we haven't seen go into either one of the two spawning areas, and so we haven't been able to confidently assign their origin. This is some of the basic data that's actually going to go into the management strategy evaluation operating models. So now that I've given you kind of an overview of the context for bluefin and the ch substantial challenges that are faced with providing management advice, I'll go into the MSE process in in general, but with bluefin specific uh, examples. Uh, there's about nine different steps to the MSE process. Uh, first, identifying the participants, then identifying the management objectives, identifying the uncertainties, developing operating models, which are simulations of the, of the process, parameterizing or conditioning and fitting them to data, identifying and testing management strategies, simulation testing them, summarizing their performance, and then eventually adopting the desired management. This is often an iterative feedback loop with a lot of steps along the way to solicit engagement from stakeholders in a number of the different aspects of the process. Now, in terms of how this has occurred at ICAT, right now, this year and uh, coming up in 2022 is gonna be the culmination of about an eight-year process to develop a management strategy evaluation and management procedures. It began in 2014 and is continued with a, a number of roadblocks and stumbling blocks and delays along the way. In particular, the challenges we faced are the sheer complexity of the population dynamics and the management context, which has made developing the operating models particularly challenging. So in 2022, we are at a stage where we're going. We've got can, working candidate management procedures. We're going to be requesting feedback from commissioners and managers on those. In fact, this week we're doing our first round of meetings at what we call an ambassador meetings with stakeholders to be able to better get them up to speed on the process and explain many of the key things, such as the trade-offs they're going to have to understand. And as you can see, it was not. It's not something that one would embark upon lightly, given the time frame that it took for, for bluefin tuning in the Atlantic. I could not envision more, a more complicated situation to have to develop operating models. So management objectives, I alluded to them previously, and, and here there's really two degrees of management objectives. Conceptual, which are the desired goals for the fishery, i.e. We, we want certain things, we, maybe we want stable, total allowable catch. Oftentimes a fishery, and particularly commercial fisheries, want stability over almost all other things because stability means that they've got dependable fisheries, they can have dependable markets. Now operational management objectives are specific codified and measurable ones that are then which the performance is, be, is evaluated in the MSE. Here, turning the conceptual stable TAC into operational means defining a certain percentage of change in TAC in each year, e.g. wanting no more than 20% up or down change in TAC. And oftentimes, when you can get stakeholders to actually commit to something like that, they can say, they can say yes, this greater than that would be undesirable amount of change because my market couldn't handle that much increase and I wouldn't want that much decrease. And that turns the conceptual into operational. To put it in the context of how uh, of something in the South Atlantic, quite often we uh, are embarking upon at the center, 
in stakeholder participatory modeling. This is happening for the Dolphin Wahoo project. This is getting us to the point where we can define conceptual management objectives, and then the next step will be turning those into operational. It'll allow us to then evaluate the performance of management procedures and meeting them. Now at ICAT, and in general throughout fisheries globally, there's usually four key management objectives. Safety, you want the stock to be in a not fall before, below a certain limit, like the limit. You don't want the stock to go extinct and get to be such a, a, a low level of biomass that you're going to lead to depensation. Right now, B limb is not defined yet for bluefin tuna, but ideally you want that probability of falling below that very low. Status, you ideally want the stock status to be in a good state relative to fishing and relative to biomass. Stability, again, I alluded to stability of the fishery. And then yield, ideally we want the maximum overall yield that we can get out of the system. And these four objectives to be plotted on a four panel quadrant, this one happens to be for North Atlantic Albacore, which is another MSE that's ongoing at ICAT, showing three different management procedures. And the selection process for the management procedures are essentially choosing the one that provides the greatest performance across the four key objectives. And this is a decision for managers to decide upon which of the management objectives they prefer to emphasize or most value. It's quite often that other alternative management objectives could arise out of the process, such as high catch rates. In particular for recreational fisheries, oftentimes they value opportunity as much or more than simply yield. And so re recreational opportunity could be another management objective of an another uh, MSC project. Now, I talked about operating models. Operating models are the plausible scenarios for the stock and fishery dynamics. They're basically the simulation testing environment for managed procedures. The key first step in that is to identify the uncertainties that need to be captured. And the key reasons for this is because what you're trying to do is develop managed procedures that are robust to all the things you don't know but are likely possibilities. Even if you can't actually fit a stock assessment model to them, you can still build a hypothetical operating model that entertains this and allows you to test whether your management works under that situation. Usually you want multiple operating models that reflect the key uncertainties. In terms of the developing of operating models, you have two sets of operating models in general practice. One is a reference set, which are your most plausible scenarios, and then a robustness set. The reference set is where you screen, all, screen and test all the manager procedures. This is basically running every one of the manager procedures against the gauntlet of the reference set. Then, because you can't capture all of the uncertainties in the reference set, and there are a number that may be less plausible, but potentially ones you might want to evaluate, you develop a robustness set. These are the what if scenarios that you screen the top performing management procedures against to ensure that your management is robust to it, or to know that your management procedure fails under conditions X, Y, and Z. These are situations such as a dramatic change in the ecosystem, things that you may not have been able to anticipate but potentially might happen. Climate change may either be in a reference set or a robustness test set depending on the nature of the management procedures and the testing environment. So the operating model structure for Atlantic Bluefin is a seven area model. You can see this adds a substantial amount of complexity. There's fish movement across each one of these boxes in space and time. It goes from 1864 to 2019. There's four temporal quarters. Spawning occurs for both stocks in quarter two in the Mediterranean for the Eastern stock and the Gulf of Mexico and Western Atlantic for the Western stock. It's age structured with three age groups and it has multiple fleets 14 CPU indices and five fishery independent indices. So the next step once you've built the operating models is conditioning them and this is fitting them to the actual data. This grounds them into the actual historical data you've got and allows the OMs to have a full range of plausible past stock trajectories and it's a key element to being able to reflect how the model would actually deal with the data you've got. And it's 
it's very similar to and analogous to fitting a stock assessment model. You're just fitting a number of them so you have multiple operating models. And ideally, you include things such as regime shifts compatible with the hypotheses you may have, that may have been considered in past assessments, as well as uncertainties in a number of other key parameters. And the data that you'd use is essentially the same as you'd use in a stock assessment, but in this case, we've also added movement data using electronic tags and mixing data fitting to odal of chemistry and genetics. So I've invoked two concepts, movement and mixing. Movement in the context of the, this MSE is the rate of fish moving, and it's a rate that is based on the age class of fish, the time period, and the season, and the stock of origin. And there's a probability of a fish of a given size and origin moving from one box to the next. Mixing is the resulting proportion in each area. So movement data comes from electronic tags that parameterize the, the movement matrix. Mixing data is the resulting pie chart of Western or Eastern fish, and that then is fit to the odal of chemistry and genetics data. So we've got two different concepts inherent in the modeling. It creates a fairly complicated set of movement dynamics, which is actually essential because the movement and mixing is dynamic and is complicated within uh, the actual population. And what we're trying to do is develop managed procedures that are robust to these dynamics, particularly when you've got a much larger population here in the East, mixing with a smaller population in the West. So we've built a reference grid of 48 different operating models. There's three recruitment assumptions. One, a low stock recruitment, which is basically the uh, low or two line that switches from low to high. Uh, later on, this is entertaining explicitly a regime shift. The next is the high stock recruitment or the Beverton Holt stock recruitment relationship, which assumes that the no regime shift. And then a third option, which is the same as level one, but then shifts to the other earlier regime 10 years in the future. So that's basically under the assumption that if you have had a regime shift in the past, you're like, you have to entertain the possibility of it in the future. And this creates an exceptionally difficult testing environment for any management procedure to have to face an uh, upcoming regime shift and determine whether management is robust to that. It's really one of the quintessential issues we're gonna face in every single one of our stock assessments as we face an unknown future. Then there's, uh, assumptions about the basic biology and the spawning fraction and age and natural mortality. We've had two different vectors here. Then scale, and because the models have a very difficult ability to estimate the total population scale, this is one of the challenges of many of our stock assessment models in that they cannot, they can estimate relative status, but they have a challenging ability to estimate scale. We've had to invoke prior assumptions and about the total scale because it's a very strong assumption and it scales all of the other resulting benchmarks uh, we actually have four different scale options that are crossed and then we have two assumptions about the length composition weighting and if you've done stock assessments you know that differential weighting of different components can be highly influential and you don't know which one is necessarily uh, correct and because it's influential and we don't know which one is right and it leads to different results, we've actually entertained both weights of length composition. And by weighting the length composition high, it basically trades off between the in, fitting the indices well or the length composition well. And then we've crossed all of these axes resulting in 48 different operating models. You'll see in red, plausibility weights assigned to each of those levels within a factor. And you might ask, how do we determine the plausibility weights? How do we come up with something that is usually one of the most challenging things for a review panel to ever to entertain is how one would weight multiple competing and conflicting hypotheses. Well, what we did was we embarked upon a Delphi approach. We had to do it in a remote manner because we were working entirely remotely for the past year and a half. And we developed a poll where the participants in the scientific working group would score each level within an axis of uncertainty. And then those, would, each scientist would have to provide a scientific rationale if you diverge from the default, which was equal weighting. And then if there were highly divergent scores, they would be reconciled through a discussion process where one would have to defend choosing a weighting that was very different from the default. 
then you'd hear that discussion from the rest of the group. You'd be allowed to rescore depending on if you, if you felt that the scientific rationale had swayed your decision. And then the averages, the scores were multiplied together, or the averages across the scores of all participants were taken to score each level within an axis, and then the product of each axis weights were taken to obtain the OM weightings. So you can see that the end result is a down weighting of the regime shift, equal weighting of the two stock recruitment relationships, equal weighting of the two, uh, two biology, a down weighting of the low stock, uh, so high stock size in the West, low in the East, and then equal weighting in the length composition. And this Delphi approach is commonly employed, in, though in slightly different manners, in other decision-making forum where one needs to be able to make decisions about uh, things such as weighting different plausibilities. And so the next step was fitting the operating models to the data. And here I pro provided a link to all of the operating models and all the essential information. Essentially, conditioning is fitting to the stock to the data as you would fit to a stock assessment. You'll see that there's HTML files for all of the operating models. You'll see the fits to the composition data, fits to indices, fits to length comp, diagnostics, and all the other kind of information that you would find out of a normal stock assessment is essentially fitting to the stock assessment data. Now, the next step is to identify candidate management procedures. And here we entertain two different varieties. One, empirical management procedures, which use indices. These are nice because they're simple to explain and implement. If the index goes down, the TAC goes down. If the index goes up, the TAC goes up. And then model-based management procedures, which are similar to employing a stock assessment model, in which case you would derive the TAC advice from the assessment model outputs. Here are the indices that are considered for management procedures. Uh, the, on the left are indices that are in the Western area. Some of these apply to Western only stock, particularly the ones from the Gulf of Mexico. Here on the right are Eastern area indices. There's a mixture of surveys and fishery data. You can see these blue lines are at the actual model fits to them in the condition. One of the key aspects of fitting to the actual data is that you're able to then derive the expected and likely behavior of that index so that when you simulate it into the future, you simulate it warts and all. And as you can see, some of them fit well, some of them fit rather poorly. And when we simulate that data in the future, we want to simulate this error, so the lack of fit, as well as the autocorrelation in the lack of fit. So that when we develop management procedures based on these indices, we honor the actual performance of their in those indices in the condition. And if it fits well in the history, then it should be a fairly well-performing index in the future. If it fits poorly, ideally that falls out as not a very reliable index for management procedures. Now, here's a diagram for how a management procedure would work for blue and tuna. Because each management procedure is really a package deal, it implies a rule for the west area and a rule for the east area attack. That is set then for each of these areas. There's a western uh, western attack and eastern attack. And here below is one realization of the time series of biomass, the expected value of the index, and then the resulting catch for applying one candidate management procedure over one operating model. What it shows is the time series, the biomass here in the historical time period, and then the white in the future, and how the biomass changes. As the biomass changes, the index changes, and as the index changes, then it results has this resulting feedback on tampering down the catch and dropping the catch. And in this case, this is a regime shift recruitment scenario where the eastern SSB actually shifts to a new lower regime in the future. Then we calculate the statistics for each one of the CMPs applying to uh, the biological stock in terms of status and safety because we want to know how each stock is doing. And then statistics on yield and stability of yield apply to the area because we can only apply attack to an actual area. We don't have the ability at this point to 
obtain a catch from a specific stock of origin fish. We may in the future, as genetics and our ability to more rapidly identify the genetic origin comes, on, genetic origin comes online, but for right now, these apply to, to area. But what happened is this, this cycle of management procedure application would repeat itself within the operating model, and then we'd summarize the performance over uh, a hundred year time period. And so here's a conceptual vision for how this would work. On the west is the in index, uh, in the right side in red is the index value, on the, or on the left is the index, on the right side is the TAC, the same thing for the east. And remember, it's a package deal. One of the key things that is going to happen when a management procedure is put into place is that it's going to operate on the previous year's total allowable catch. What this does is it grounds the management procedure in the thing that we know. We have a pretty good assumption that we know the catch in previous years because that's one of the things that's generally well measured and in any assessment is assumed to be known quite well. By grounding in that, it says that your starting place is known and that as you collect more values of your index, the feedback that your index should derive from the system by applying that tack should then adjust the next tack accordingly. And it's that essential feedback over time that allows the management procedure to work. You say, how could it actually work? Well, that's what the simulation testing shows us whether it works or doesn't work according to our assumptions. And so I'll, I'll run this sort of process into the future, if the TAC is, if the index is the same, then the TAC remains the same. In this case, the index for three years, we've collected three years of data, the three year average is the same, the TAC remains the same. Usually there's inherent stability built into any manager procedure because generally stakeholders want something stable. Then collect three more years of data, the index goes up in the West, the TAC increases in the West, and you'll see if you know something about Western Bluefin, the current TAC is 2350. The TAC could increase based on an index in the future. So these are actually real values, but a hypothetical management procedure. In the East, the index decreases, resulting in a TAC decrease. And it could be that the package deal actually, because it's using indices from both the West and the East, could result in a TAC increase in one area and a decrease in the other. Then to collect three more years of data, the index decreases, the TAC decreases for both the West and the East. And this is a hypothetical situation of what could occur. But it shows how it is as simple and can be as simple as the index goes up, TAC goes up, index goes down, TAC goes down. And in this case, we've set the TAC for three years in a row, which is a decision point about whether managers want two or three or more years of constant TAC. The more often TAC can be set, potentially the more responsive the TAC is to changes in the index, but also the more variable the TAC advice might be. Now, some of the key aspects of this is the inherent stability, and people often ask, when is a stock assessment going to occur, and what, what role does a stock assessment actually have in this process and stock assessments it, when manager procedures have put in, been put into place like for instance for southern bluefin tuna uh, there's still been routine stock assessments put on, on a more reduced frequency though and the role for that is so that you can evaluate whether what your stock status is and whether your operating models and the mse is actually on track and whether you need to revise your the condition you know, or the structure of the operating models. But in general, the TAC advice would come from the management procedure. So you ask, how do we come up with managed procedures? And this has uh, been a set of multiple development teams. We've actually got nine different managed procedures in contention with multiple different nations and scientists involved in developing them. There's a number that many most are empirical that, and use strictly indices. A few are model-based, and it's really a competitive evolutionary process where different modeling teams have independently derived their CMPs, tested them, improved them, and then looked at what others are doing and, and incorporated and pegged, borrowed, and st stolen good advice from others as they've seen some, what works and what doesn't work. And it's that process of evolution and competition that has really allowed 
them us to get to where we are where we've got management procedures that are working key element is that it's really only performance that matters one could say or look at certain indices and say that one prefers index one or index two but really it, it's only whether it performs that matters at this point and performance is measured against the operational management criteria there will be an element of acceptability in particular as this is presented and rolled out to stakeholders and managers once we've got top performing management procedures then they may say well i don't like this index because i don't trust it or i don't like other aspects of the cmp for one reason or another and in that case we'll have to have those discussions about the reliability of the indices their potential for continuation in the future if it's a survey that's costly and a number number of other things that really only matter once we've determined whether it works or not and it's really not necessary for us to debate uh, a management procedure for its indices till we've determined that it works and so here are some preliminary results about what works and what doesn't you just see on the x-axis is a number of the different management procedures at different degrees of tuning. I haven't really gone into what tuning is, but tuning is basically a knob that says whether that procedure is tuned to be aggressive or less aggressive. And it's a degree of aggressiveness is how hard it fishes, which is a knob you can say hard, hard, medium, or lightly fished, all within a particular CMP. And all of the CMPs have a knob for that kind of tuning. And what I, I'm showing here are kind of the two key performance statistics, which is the biomass ratio in year 30. That's B over BMSY in year 30, and the average catch in year 30. So the two things that people care about the most are is status. Are we at where we want to be in year 30? And are we catching what we want to catch in year 30? Which is generally the case if we're that place in year 30, we're likely to have been there throughout most of the time period. What you can see is some clear cases of CMPs failing. And here in our box and whisker plots where you've got some CMPs that have failed where the biomass ratio is actually at zero and it's at stock extirpation for some of the CMPs over some of the 48 operating models. This is over 48 operating models. And so seeing this low tail means that this CMP is not working because it needs to work and ideally what it should work across the entire reference grid. In contrast, we see some CMPs that are performing quite well and maintaining a biomass ratio above one. This is, uh, was actually quite surprising and quite a good uh, positive news for us to see that we actually were able to, to find ones that work. They were able to manage both the East and the West population while not sacrificing yield. And so what this means is we've got the path forward and, and we've actually got CMPs that work and we've got something that we can present and refine later in 2022. Now the key results that we're going to need to convey to managers is the decision point about which manager procedure to ultimately select for advice and you can only select one is its trade-off in performance. One of the key trade-offs is between yield and stock status. The harder you fish it the more yield you're going to get but the lower the stock status is going to be the more likelihood of stock collapse you might have. And in this case, it's a pretty stark contrast between the stock biomass relative to BMSY, which ranges here from 1 to 1.5, and yield ranging from about 2.2 to 3.0 kilotons in the West, and a similar pretty stark trade-off in the East. This is going to be one of the decision points about how much one wants to fish versus where it wants stock status to be. The second decision point. Is one that's often fundamental in any kind of management procedure testing is between yield and the variability in yield. You can often get more yield if you take it when the population's high, but then cut back when it's low, in which case you're going to get highly variable yield. And in this case, on the right is a CMP, this CMP8, which is this blue one, which has higher yield but much higher variability. And you can see these are five stochastic realizations from one CMP in one operating model, which you could see highly variable yield from one management period to the next. If a fishery is okay with that kind of variability in yield, then this might be a CMP that's fine because it gets higher total yield. However, if a fishery would prefer 
more stability in yield, then one would prefer C CMP6 here, which has more stability. However, it comes at the, tr at the trade off of lower total yield. It might be that something in the middle represents the best combination and might be the selective decision based on uh, a trade off between the, the, these two management objectives. So the next steps in 2022 are actually rather, uh, there's a rather large amount of work, which is primarily involving repeated dialogue and back and forth work between what we are calling a MSE technical team, which is comprised of management procedure developers, and then the commission or the uh, what we call our, the panel two of the commission, which is really in charge of Bluefin and Albacore, who's going to be evaluating manager procedures, recommending revisions to the technical team, and it will be a back and forth iterative process to eventually, what we hope to achieve in November of next year is for the commission to adopt a manager procedure for providing 2023 advice for Eastern and Western Atlantic Bluefin. Now you ask what comes next? And in this case, there's two key elements to, to discuss. One is something called exceptional circumstances. These are the get out of your management procedure card. What happens when something that you did not simulation test or an act of nature that you cannot, uh, that you didn't consider happens? And that can happen. Uh, also, you can have survey failure. Uh, or other things, which might all mean that you don't have the index that you relied upon, what happens to your manager procedure then? And that is the exceptional circumstances provisions, which need to be defined. Usually they can be adopted after an MP is put into place, but one of the key exceptional circumstances might be a global pandemic or oftentimes natural disasters. Another question that's often asked, and I alluded a little bit to this, is what happens to the routine stock assessment process? And in this case, it would continue along, but not necessarily be needed for advice. It would be needed to determine whether you're on track, whether you're stat you might need it for status, and whether you need to refine your OMs or recondition. So I'll move away from Bluefin a little bit and go into more a more general discussion of MSE that I think is going to be informative for uh, for this forum. Uh, there's two degrees of MSE, and I deluded that it's a quite intensive process at times, particularly if it involves a full stakeholder process. There's desk MSEs, which can often be conducted by a single or several analysts. It often requires no stakeholder input, and the reason being that the operational management objectives are predefined. If you know what you need to test and attune to uh, your management objectives, then you can task an analyst to go ahead and perform the MSE. It may or may not inform management advice or resource allocation, and it may, not, may or may not result in MP adoption. Usually it can be done in about two to 12 months with one to two full-time employees. They also can focus on general research, such as testing performance of catch control rules or reference points. In contrast, the full Stakeholder inclusive MSE is happens and may need to be done when the conceptual or operational management objectives need to be defined, i.e., we don't know what we want. This is often the case when we've got I'll go into when stakeholders who haven't been part of the process may not have been at the table, or where we may need to redefine what our objectives are. It requires iterative stakeholder analyst participant interaction. And the process is intended to produce management action. And so that's one of the key things that this is actually for real and the results and the decisions are going to matter. And that's why you need stakeholders involved from the get go. It's also highly resource intense. It requires a long time commitment and multiple staff. We have fortunately within the council process a quite accomplished and existing stakeholder inclusion process through our, our APs as well as some of the informal work that we've been doing in our, our stakeholder participatory modeling. So there's a, a lot of existing communication pathways to accomplish this kind of uh, an exercise. Now, the other thing that often comes up is what are not management strategy evaluations? And in this case, there's a lot of analyses that are quite useful and may give manager advice, but don't need the full feedback loop or stakeholder involvement of an MSE. Key being that this, 
stakeholder management action simulation testing feedback loop is really programming intensive. And in that case, things like projections of alternative size limits, even maybe spatial temporal closures, and the numerous gamut of sensitivity runs of assessments don't usually require that full closed loop simulation. So we can get an answer a lot cheaper and faster, which is key to determining how we allocate our resources when we've got questions, but we're not necessarily sure which tool to use at each situation. Now, what I want to bring up is something that is a, an ongoing work that actually is both a bridge between the current stock assessment and a full managed procedure, which is the interim approach, and also may quite well lend itself to improving a lot of the responsiveness to our existing management. And this is the interim approach that was uh, published in a paper by Quang Hun uh, and a number of co-authors that adjusts the tack between assessments using an index. That can be buffered against uncertainty index depending on the tuning parameters of the management procedure, but it allows us to say, okay, we've got a stock assessment and we've got indices in between. We know that those indices are telling us something about the stock and we'd like to, to adjust the ABC in the interim rather than simply have to run another stock assessment when we've got the indices. And in addition, it allows it to be more responsive because the delay by the, in the time that a stock assessment finishes, usually the management advice is at least two to four years dated by the time that TAC goes into to actual place. But we've at that time gotten several years of indices. And so it should allow us to be more responsive in our management. And in fact, when we put this into place for Gulf of Mexico Red Group, we found that it was indeed more responsive to episodic events like red tides. And you can imagine if you set your stock assessment projection up assuming no red tide and a red tide comes into play and you've seen it in your indices, there's a strong imperative to want to adjust your tack to account for something that you know and seen has happened but your assessment projections haven't accounted for. And so in some cases, it's just a really straightforward application and, and it makes a lot of sense. As you can see, here's the equation. It seems a little bit complicated, but essentially you're just adjusting the catch advice based on the value of the index relative to a reference time period. That reference time period usually being the terminal years of your stock assessment when that catch advice or ABC advice was put into play. And then the two tuning parameters, beta and sigma, uh, adjust for how responsive you want it to be in terms of how much interannual variability and in catch you might want to mod moderate for, and then sigma being the uncertainty you have in that index value. And here's an application to an actual South Atlantic species. This is vermilion snapper, and this is a initial exploration of how this might come into play using the DLM toolkit and using an index of abundance to adjust the tack between assessments and it's a comparison between uh, the red line which is a fixed tack set every 10 years on the basis of a stock assessment. This is somewhat akin to our status quo approach where we do an assessment, we set the tack and that tack stays in play for any number of years. Then the blue, the black line is an annual assessment. This would be wonderful if we could do annual assessments in, in every year. Um, Unfortunately, resources don't definitely preclude our ability to do that in every year. Then the blue line is using an average index to adjust the TAC. So, to, so you've done an assessment and then you adjust it based on the index. And what you can see is your SSB, it can keep your SSB at about the same level as you would if you had the Cadillac version of an annual assessment. And it can keep your TAC quite stable as well and it avoids the substantial overshooting and undershooting, and this is somewhat of an extreme example, but you can imagine that any given stock assessment uh, and setting a fixed tack for a, a fairly long time period of time may not be the best way to manage a fishery for both stability as well as stock status. Now, some of the applications that might occur in the South Atlantic, in particular, the dolphin might be one a really good application particular, the ACL comes from average landings over a fairly long time period. That doesn't provide any feedback in any given year because it results in hitting the ACL when years are really good and there's a lot of dolphin or failing to come close to the ACL in poor years. And there's a potential, so you could see how something that would have some better feedback 
could likely do a lot better. In particular, also dolphins don't live very long. So assuming a catch limit based on past history, when none of the fish in the fishery are still alive, is relatively insensitive to the rapidly and fast changing dynamics of the population. Then we've got, as elucidated in a lot of the stakeholder participatory workshops, conflicting conceptual and operational management objectives, particularly between recreational and commercial stakeholders, as well as between different regions, where some regions want high, high catch rates of dolphin, some want hot trophy dolphin, and they may have different needs for particularly for the charter industry, different needs for their customers on what constitutes a good opportunity and a good trip. And in addition, I think there's a high potential for external or environmental drivers to population as we see in changes in temperature and changes in this average South Florida temperature and external drivers and particularly driven by fisheries outside of the jurisdiction of the United States where removals from other countries may be quite influential. And there may be environmental drivers that are outside of any control in terms of uh, the simply climate or other induced variability. And in those situations, a management procedure that is more responsive to these things may indeed provide a path forward. I've sort of started to kind of entertain one. I, I, we have a lot of collaborations with Jay Cal at NC State University, who actually has an ongoing MSE project designed to evaluate dolphin fish and black sea bass. And so this is a good opportunity for collaboration with many of our partners. And in particular, I pulled this figure from a paper by Wes Merton, who's done some really groundbreaking work on tagging and tracking dolphin, which shows that there's a pretty strong connection between South Florida fisheries and later on capture throughout the coast. So if we could possibly generate a management procedure based on catch rates, maybe in the winter time in the Keys, this could be a good empirical indicator for what you're likely to see in future months up and down the Atlantic coast. And if that tack was set based on catch rates early in the year, we might have a much more responsive management procedure that would go up or down depending on what nature or other fisheries provide to the Atlantic West the Atlantic coast. And then in addition, by going through the stakeholder stakeholder uh, modeling process where we're defining multiple conceptual and operational management objectives, some of which might be a spreading out of the TAC over multiple areas or an allocation across multiple sectors, we might be able to develop a management procedure that would achieve the highest or maximum uh, impact for uh, the, the sum total of the stakeholders. And that's really the process for developing a management procedure against multiple and possibly conflicting management objectives. And that's something that it, we'd really like to see go on. And I think it offers us a, a potentially productive path forward for empirical management procedures. So in conclusion, what I would hope the take home is, is that empirical management procedures could be a paradigm shift for fisheries management. We really generally only know two things well, the recent catch and the recent indices. Much of the rest of the things we put in the stock assessments comes from either much older data or some fairly strong assumptions. If we could lean on the things that we know quite well and develop management procedures responsive to those things, we could probably develop better management. Better management being that often it provides stability, which is a key uh, management objective to not have substantial variability intact in any given year. And one of the weaknesses of our stock assessments are that they cannot get absolute scale very well. And then we've seen in recent, uh, in repeated applications of even data rich stock assessments, they can vary in their absolute scale by as much as 36%. So when you redo the stock assessment with three or four years of data, you get a different absolute scale, which means that your TAC varies up and down just simply based on that. And that presents quite a challenge to the stability of advice. Then responsiveness. Empirical management procedures can provide a much more responsive TAC, particularly because our advice is often a two to five year future projection. And if we can mo moderate it according to the data that we get in hand from our indices, 
you could probably be much more relevant to what's actually going on in the water. Then robustness. I talked, I touched on how climate change and environmental variation is likely to challenge the assumption of stationarity. How do we develop management that's robust to it? We build those scenarios into the operating models so that we can say that the management procedure is or is not robust to those eventualities. Then simplicity. A lot of times our management winds up being quite difficult to, under, to understand. Only some people uh, can, not everyone is on the same page in terms of what the key important uncertainties are. And it becomes quite difficult to explain. But there's sort of quite a, a big simplicity to management procedures. And that the, the index goes up, the catch goes up, and vice versa. It usually resonates with stakeholders. It certainly did in a number of the applications where it's uh, been employed uh, globally. And then uh, its ability to optimize for multiple objectives. And in this case, NS1 guidelines for optimal yield explicitly consider multiple objectives in what the definition of optimal yield is. Those could be societal, economic, ecological objectives. Right now, we optimize in our projections only for yield. And we don't have a very good or explicit incorporation of multiple objectives. And this provides a process for us to be able to incorporate them more explicitly in the management. And so I'll, in terms of conclusions for management strategy evaluation, I don't want to come away with it being the panacea. It's, I, but I do want to give some advice on when I, it, I think it's useful to be considered by decision makers. In particular, high priority situations for full stakeholder MSEs when there's a really difficult policy decision. When there's heretofore intractable stakeholder conflicts, such that those stakeholders haven't been part of the process. Quite often, if they're disenfranchised, and the ecosystem is one that's often the disenfranchised, and a, a good example of a uh, of a MSE recently has been the in New England, the Atlantic herring MSE, which included stakeholders from the lobster fishery that uses herring for bait and the bluefin fishery for whom herring is one of the top prey species. And by including those multiple stakeholders who are all stakeholders in herring management in the system, you better incorporate for the trade-offs that decision making has to be that a decision about one aspect of the system affects other aspects of the system. And if they're not all at the table of stakeholders, then you're not accounting for all of the things that need to be done in making a management decision. The next aspect is when the scientific uncertainty threatens the integrity of the current management approach or when the status quo management is clearly failing. And I say this is a situation of the known unknowns. We know it's failing. We don't quite know why. In this case, that's one that I would say is a high priority for an MSC. And then when there are conditions that make the future projections really unclear climate change being one of them. And here, this is an unknown, unknown situation where we don't know what the future is necessarily going to hold for our biology because the biological interactions are quite often nonlinear. And we really don't know what the impacts are going to be in terms of relative to the human dynamics. And here is where the full stakeholder process is really critical because we're all entering an uncertain future. And unless we're all at the table, relying solely on scientists to sketch out what the human response to the future is going to be, is going to miss key insights from stakeholders. And where I'd like to kind of focus this is on something such as traditional ecological knowledge, which is the knowledge of stakeholders passed down for many generations. Those generations have seen a change in climate. They've been able to pass on and integrate things and changes that may have occurred and human responses, because it's really the human response that is the management procedure. And that's where bringing stakeholders into that unknown unknowns to develop management that may be robust to that is going to be key and to parameterize the operating models of what might happen. And then other situations where a full stakeholder MSC may be requested, but simpler approaches might suffice when there's an empirical management procedure that might improve on status quo management to modify or adopt a catch control rule. Quite often, you'll see MSEs done for catch or harvest control rules. I prefer using the word catch control. Often that's cited as the reason to do an MSE. And I would argue that in fact, that's a very limited 
use of a full MSE. Oftentimes a catch control rule can be put into place, a pretty good one without having to run the full MSE. And then I would prioritize the higher priority ones above over simply in putting a catch control rule in place because a pretty good catch control rule is gonna be better than nothing. And if you're gonna wait four years for a catch control rule, you might as well put something uh, pretty good in place while you're waiting. That's a little controversial, but that's my personal opinion. Next is for mainly tactical decisions, such as allocation of survey and scientific resources. Usually this could be a desk MSE because we know the management objectives are right. And then uh, research and scientific questions that are not intended to support management advice. In this case, again, a desk MSE can be done and won't require the full stakeholder participation necessarily. So with that, I'll refer people to other resources. If you want more information on catch strategies, there's a web page here from our colleagues at uh, Pew Charitable Trust. There's also all of the information from the Atlantic Bluefin Tuna Manager Strategy Evaluation on a splash page that has a copious amount of documentation, the operating models, as well as all the other information that I've alluded to today if people are uh, seeking additional information. With that, I'd like to acknowledge a number of colleagues at ICAT who've helped to put together this presentation and these materials. My colleagues at the National MSE Working Group, whose insights I borrowed very copiously from in this presentation, and my colleagues at the Southeast Center who's provided materials and done a lot of work in this regard. And I'm just uh, I'm happy to be able to report on the things that they've done. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you, John. Uh, if you hold on one second, I will uh, take control back over. And uh, I want to go over um, briefly how to raise your hand and ask questions again. All right, uh, once again, if you want to ask a question, uh, click on that red icon. Uh, it should that should represent your microphone. It's gonna stay red on your first click. Um, and when you raise your hand, I will unmute you. And you'll hear the uh, webinar say, you've been unmuted by an organizer. If your microphone is still red, um, then you can indicate uh, that, or then you can click on the button and it should turn green and you can ask a question. Or you can type a question into the question box. And I see that Chester has his hand raised. Let me unmute you, Chester. Hold on one second. You're unmuted, Chester. Chip, there you go. There, here I am. Thank you, Chip. Um, and John, thank you so much. That was an absolutely excellent, excellent presentation. And it, 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 it brought in a lot of pieces that in my mind have sort of been floating around out there uh, for a long time, but never have really been put into one place or into one program or whatever we want to call it. So thank you so much. And my question is really is not to you, John, but more it's to, to Andy Strelchek and to John Carmichael. And that I am fascinated with this idea or process of the, the sort of the boom and the bust of having a uh, an assessment done every five to 10 years and then trying to play catch up if things are not working out the way that you would like. And the idea of having some sort of indices that you're following between those assessments, I think is a, is a really, really excellent idea. Unfortunately, a lot of the times we find, and I, you know, ICAT is working under far less constraints from the standpoint of, of uh, magnets. And in fact, they're specifically accepted um, than we do as, as a council. And I, I wanted to ask both John and Andy, is this a procedure that we could incorporate uh, given the constraints that we operate under with uh, Magnuson? Thank you. I'll, I'll mute myself. <laughs> 
All right, John, I see you have your hand up in response. John Carmichael. Yep, thanks, Chip. Do you hear me? Yes. All right, so yeah, just, you know, Chester, that is definitely something that could be done. And what you're talking about is one of the things that goes along with what the Science Center has talked about in the past about doing the interim analyses, where you would tie things to a survey or something and see how things are going. So, you know, that's a little aside from the MSE, but that concept is certainly valid and could be pursued. You know, when it's been looked at in the South Atlantic, one of the challenges so far that's been raised by the assessment team is the difficulty in finding indices that they feel is appropriately representative of what's going on with the fishery and the population to where they would have confidence in tying potentially tack changes back to that survey value. So, you know, you need the scientists to have confidence, then we also need the managers to have confidence in doing this as well. And, and that's the current challenge that's being looked into by the Science Center. But my understanding is, you know, we are committed to that general idea, just trying to uh, work through the current challenges we have with assessments and then find the species where it seems that it's a potential to do it successfully. I don't think Andy's on the call. Uh, Andy is here today. He has his hand up. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I just didn't feel I had much to add based on John's comments. I agree with uh, obviously how John responded to Chester, and we've certainly taken the interim analysis approach um, for the Gulf of Mexico and started applying that to a number of our species. I certainly see a lot of value and utility with the MSE approach in the South Atlantic and being able to use that to address a number of our kind of challenging uh, scientific and management issues. So um, although the constraints are a little bit different than ICAT, I, I don't see this as something that can't be used for management purposes uh, under Magnuson. Um, there might be just some more limitations in terms of how we're able to use it. All right, thank you, Andy. Alexi, I see you have your hand up. Yes, uh, thank you, John. Uh, there was a lot to uh, uh, to digest within one hour. Um, there were too many questions swirling, but I was wondering. You mentioned that uh, that. The, uh, that unfortunately, uh, you and your colleagues um, uh, across the pond realized that the the structured models that were in use were not particularly useful uh, assessment models, and, and um, um, <clears throat> don't know what the details are. But well, uh, yet uh, I'm pretty sure that. Uh, there, uh, essentially, the same structure was utilized in the uh, operation uh, models. And so in that sense, how do you reconcile uh, that fact? And uh, how do you ensure that the simulations that we generate and the conclusions that we make uh, do have some uh, representation of reality and in, in that we can uh, test it and therefore um, you know, ex expect that, that um, our decisions that we make for the immediate future um, are supported by, uh, by our con conceptual modeling. Thanks, Alexia. I think I understand. Uh, Fundamentally, the operating models have two different stocks, and it's keeping track of each one of those stocks inside each of the operating models, which is totally different than the stock assessments that think that the western area and the eastern area are unit stocks. That's the big difference in between the MSE and the stock assessments. Now, how do we know that the advice we're getting is robust or matches, that the operating hour performance matches 
reality. That's the process of conditioning, to actually fitting to data. It's not just generating a simulation and saying that this is a simulated population. It's a simulated but fit to data population, which is really the key to ground it in things that we've observed. And then its lack of fit to what we've observed then is translated, particularly the lack of fit to the indices gets translated to unreliability of those indices. And that's what's fundamentally different about creating operating models and fitting them to the data rather than just creating simulated populations and saying this is a simulated reality. It is that you've got to ground it to the data you've got. That's really the only thing we can say that we've got anything that we might know about. That's the empirical information. And that's where I didn't go into like looking at fits to the uh, electronic tagging data, fits to the genetics, fits to the odolith microchemistry. But that's all part of it and it's all there. And it's taken multiple years, in fact, for a number of the, the bluefin experts to gain a comfort level with that whether the operating models are actually reflecting reality. And in some cases, it's missing the ball on some things. In some cases, it's hitting them on others. But the key is that it's got enough complexity built into it that allows us to test whether management procedures are robust to a really wide range of uncertainties about stock dynamics. Right. Thank you, John. But if, if I could just for a second to follow on this, but uh, the stock assessment model, the, the each stretch model, either VPU or statistical catch of age, are are doing the same. You are feeding, uh, uh, you're feeding your model to the existing data, and you pretty much uh, match the complexity of your model the, the, to the amount of information available. Although I I understand that operating model can always be more sophisticated and cover many more details than a typical stock assessment. But I thought you, when you brought an example of uh, adding uh, a few data points and uh, which result in you know significant change in scale, and I think that's that's why essentially you don't have the biomass-based reference points for tunas. And, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, uh, but that essentially indicates that uh, <laughs> yeah, we we still have a, a problem with the uh, 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 essentially estimating the parameters of, of 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 the population, which you know could be same problems that 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 you will have with the operating model, is it not? Or so there has to be, a, a, for example, you could be like breaking the, the time series into, uh, you know, two parts and one part you would use for the parameterization, then the other part you would use for um, evaluation of, of your uh, uh, operating model uh, uh, reliability, something of that sort. I think the fundamental difference is that we're not believing any particular operating model. Mm -hmm. We are determining whether manager procedure A, B, or C works across a whole suite of operating models. And then what actually gets put into place is that manager procedure. So we never have to say that this operating model or the stock assessment is the truth. We have, we say that in fact, this indicator works according, it works and works well despite all of these uncertainties. And that's the key. That's what we can actually, we know there's a lot of uncertainty. And whereas the best assessment approach kind of requires us to entertain one or a suite of models as the truth. And that's why it's a paradigm shift away from that. And and that's, it takes a little bit getting used to how that's going to play out, but that's, it is quite different in approach. All right. Thank you, John. That's, that's something really good to think about.
All right, Scott Crossan has his hand up. Yeah, hey John, I, I guess my question is a little bit different. I'm, when I think about lupin or, or the mahi that you brought up, these are these are species that are, you know, presumably they're single species fisheries or, or, or close to it, and they presumably have relatively low discard mortality rates. When you try to expand this to like a multi-species complex that we have with like snapper grouper in the South Atlantic, is that even a viable option? And I, I start thinking that the options are going to start expanding exponentially if you start bringing in all these different species. And some of them um, have significant discard mortality associated with being caught as part of other fisheries. And so, how, what what happens when you try and expand an MSC to something this complex? Great question. ICAT is doing that with a MSC for tropical tunas, where there's big eye, yellowfin, and skipjack, where you've got three different population dynamics all fished by one fishery, and so you've got to keep track of basically three different species while you catch them all with one fleet with big nets around fish aggregating devices. So that's being explored. It just it just becomes a more complicated operating model with more different management objectives. Do you want more big eye or more skipjack? And that becomes one of your trade-offs because you're probably not going to get uh, be able to maximize both. Now you brought up the reef fish fishery, which is a really good one and how those could could be evaluated. I, I, what I would say is in particular to, there's a request now to do an MSE for the reef fish fishery to evaluate management options. I would probably argue at this point, it doesn't need an MSE. It doesn't need the full feedback loop because there's a number of probably lower hanging questions that need to be answered about how one could at least just define some sort of seasonality that might minimize discards before we get to a full feedback loop simulation. And I think that's really where I would say, let's define the question before we embark on developing pretty complicated operating models for like five species. Kyle has his hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, John. Uh, nice presentation. Um, this question is really a follow-up to Chester's initial question, um, and, and maybe for for others with expertise on on this um, who are on the call. But uh, in the South Atlantic, um, with our, our current system, the the bottleneck. Uh, to, to fishery management is really on the science end right now um, with data provision and stock assessment. And I, I can foresee if we switch to an interim um, analysis approach that um, the Science Center could provide management advice, catch advice for uh, a lot of species on an annual basis. And I could see the, the bottleneck then um, shifting over to the management side, and and so my my question is: is there is there some flexibility in um, allowing the management system to adapt to an interim analysis, where say we have um, an amendment or, or or a handful of amendments that can accommodate that approach um, more nimbly? Um, then our current approach, which has you know, an amendment for each species every time there's um, some some new um, catch level that needs to go into a place with with a plan team and and all of the things that go along with with these new new recommendations. But just you know, is there a way to adapt the management system so that it can handle interim analyses um, um, in a better manner? Yeah, Chip, am I here? Yep, you're here. Yeah, yeah, Kyle, and thanks for that follow up. And you know, I think the short answer is, yeah, absolutely. There's there's procedures around the nation under Magnuson that implement catch limits quite quickly, changes in them quite quickly, and we have procedures even here to do it through abbreviated frameworks that can be done uh, pretty efficiently and get changes you know just of a catch limit change type of thing 
in place rapidly. Um, the bottleneck that we're seeing now really goes back to the changes in the MRIP numbers and the impact that's had on the allocations because it changed historical data, which drives the percentage allocations. And I know this is a little in the weeds, but it is pretty germane, I think. And, you know, we're under legal advice that says, well, those changes are enough that you need to do amendments. So until we get over this hurdle of dealing with the impact of the changed MRIP data, we have to do amendments for all of the catch limit changes. But once we get past that, we can go back to where, you know, a catch limit change can go in place through a quick framework action. Any other questions? Alexi, I see you have your hand up. Nobody else is asking. I'll, I'll ask just one more. John, uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, <clears throat> tunas, of course, is, is an extremely challenging uh, group of species. Uh, in this exercise, could you share your experience with the um, the feedback uh, loop uh, with the the involvement of the uh, stakeholders were there uh, clear objectives defined prior to the beginning of MSC or were there multiple objectives that were sort of and conflicting that crystallized you know through the discussion and uh, were you able and how were you able to essentially um, you know get down from from possible mix mix of objectives to something uh, that that was um, you know that the the successful compromise what was the experience thank you thanks Alexi uh, number of this feedback is going to be ongoing. In particular, you saw those four uh, SSSY, status, safety, stability, and yield, still have blanks on them. In terms of actually filling in the blanks on probabilities there, it, it didn't go so well the first time, and stakeholders being ICAT panel two, uh, because it is a difficult process for stakeholders to be able to really put down in numbers what the operational management objective might be and the real difficulty in being able to do that is because we didn't have actual results for them to see so when you present somebody with an option of what type of variability and yield you want it's very hard for someone to actually see that till they see their quota go up and down so you need to put it in terms that they actually understand so 2350 being the TAC which for bluefin you need to see that go up and down by 20 percent to see if oh does that actually cause problems for you and so it's not till we can put these trade-offs like i showed the the plot of the trade-offs in actual real numbers and real values that i think you can get a meaningful feed stakeholder and concrete stakeholder feedback that you need to actually put numbers there You can't ask somebody to to give you a hard answer if you can't give them the trade-off space they're working in, and that's I think the key take-home I I find. All right, Chester. Chester, you're muted. There you go. I'm unmuted now. Yes, sir. Um, John, again, I don't really have a question for you, but I do have a request for Mel and uh, John Carmichael. And that is, I, again, I'm really, really impressed with this presentation. And I took a look at the time. It's roughly, the presentation itself is roughly an hour long. And we've got Mel is on here. And I think I saw Carrie was here, uh, but we don't have, you know, even a majority of the of, of the uh, council members. And so, Mel, I'd like to make a request, not that we 
you know, have the a live presentation, but that this recording of this presentation uh, be presented uh, at a yet to be determined time, but at to but to full council. Thank you. Yeah, and we could talk about the best way to do that. If if you want, I can send this to uh, council members as a, as a video and they can watch on their own time. Um, given that we're up on our time limit here and I, I don't, I'm sure John has other things that he needs to go and do. Um, we really appreciate the presentation. It was a great uh, explanation of what MSEs are and some precautionary tales. Um, I, I think that's a, a great start for us as we start to consider how to use this best in management. Um, for our next uh, seminar series, which is going to be uh, November November 9th, we're going to be talking about distribution changes in Red Porgy. So thanks, everybody, for coming today, and uh, hopefully we're going to see you at our next one. Take care. Thanks, all. Bye.